Good morning, Digital Cathedral family. Glad you're with me on this Sunday morning. Uh, hope you're ready to dive into some things that I hope will uh, help conform us to the fullness of the stature of Christ, right? To come to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's what we do here at the Digital Cathedral. That's what uh, this ministry is all about, taking sons and daughters that are manifesting. And on this journey, wherever you're at, you're welcome here at the Digital Cathedral. We're all at a different place. It's all good. And, and uh, the Father's really been directing so many people in the body of Christ over the last, <coughs> excuse me, over the last few years that I think is a phenomenal thing that we're a part of. I want to start today over in Colossians chapter 3. So I want you just to open up this morning, open up your, your inner man, open up your spiritual ears, your spiritual eyes, and I'm going to, I want to, I want to talk to your spirit man this morning. Can I do that? I might introduce some things that are a little bit unfamiliar with you that you may stop and go, whoa, I need to think about that. And that's good. That's fine. That's what we want to do. So I'll introduce and tell you what we're gonna what we're gonna try to accomplish in just a minute. But I want to look at Colossians chapter three, verse one. I, I, I want to read down through verse four. Colossians chapter three, verse one says, "If then you were raised with Christ, and you have been, you were raised with Him uh, from the dead at resurrection. It birthed you again. You ascended with Him, so you've been raised with Christ." And he said, if that's true, then seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of the Father. So that's your perspective. He says, if you've been raised with Christ, Christ has ascended. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father. So he says, seek those things which are above in that dimension, in that realm, in that level of consciousness. He goes on in verse two and says, set your mind, set your view, set your attitude, set your perception. Uh, your intent, your purpose. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. So he's he's um, elevating our our um, what we're to look at, what we're to perceive, how we're to get a general view of of life itself and the things that go on in life. Then he says in verse three, "For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears." And the word there means he's unveiled or he's revealed. I'm not talking about second coming here. I'm not talking about uh, meeting him in the sky somewhere. He's talking about when he's revealed, when he's unveiled. Then you will also appear with him or you're going to be just like him. First John says, uh, it hasn't yet appeared what we shall be, but we know that when he appears, when he's revealed, when he's unveiled, that we're going to be just like him. So that's what's going on today. We're becoming more and more like him. So the, the admonition here is pretty plain. Because of your perspective, seated in the heavenly places with Christ, he says you need to set your mind, your view, your attitude, your perception, your consciousness on things above, not on things on the earth. That's a difficult job for, for most of us, right? That's a big undertaking. The mind is a powerful thing. The mind is a creative force, positive, negative. And I've, I've done a series of, a few months back, actually the first of the year, on how much of a creator you actually are. The mind can envision, it can imagine, uh, it, can, it can totally convince us of things, whether they're true or not true. If, you're, if your mind is totally set on it and sees the argument, the logic to it, it'll convince you. For example, if, if a child can believe in their mind through their imagination, that there's a monster under the bed, they are totally convinced there's a monster under the bed, they will cry though, hoot and holler for mom and dad to come in there. And eventually what most kids do is they won't go to bed now without the, without a light on. And so mom and dad give in to that, turn the light on so that the monster that's under the bed doesn't appear or come out of the closet. But the child is absolutely convinced that there's a monster there, but the light kind of helps alleviate. alleviate. Now, is it true? Absolutely, of course not. You and I know that. Yet Christians still creating monsters in their mind that they believe exist. <clears throat> so we shouldn't, I don't think we ought to laugh at children. They're not too far off base from what adults do. The mind is a, is a powerful thing. Two people can have equal ability, face the same challenge. And one will say, I can do this. And the other will say, it's impossible. I can't do it. And you know what? They're both right. They're both right because of how their mind acts. 
All of the actions that you do, every action that we submit ourselves to comes as a directive from our mind. Flesh has no power. We, we accredit, and I know what we're talking about, we're talking about our flesh, but really the flesh has no ability. Flesh has no power. My, my flesh will be right here in front of this camera until, until my mind tells my flesh, reach up there and turn it off. And I'll stay right here in this position till, till my mind tells my flesh, it's time to get up and walk out of the room that you do your recording in. So the flesh doesn't have any power. It waits for a directive from the mind and the mind will be influenced from one or two sources, either spirit or five physical senses. So what I wanna do this morning, I wanna I want take a couple of weeks and just talk about our mind. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take it down just a couple of notches uh, some things I want you to see about in the mind that I think we're at a place here at the Digital Cathedral that we can receive this and we can get a hold of it. So let, let me begin over with a couple of verses of scripture we've heard uh, uh, many times throughout our church life that, that concern the mind. Romans chapter 12, for example, verse 2. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. And the word transformed, there is the word metamorpho. We get the word metamorphosis from it. It means to be changed into another form. Do not be conformed to this world, but be changed into another form. How, how do we move from not being conformed to the world and all the systems of the world where our senses are feeding to us? How do, how do we enter into that metamorphosis to where we're changed in, into something that we never were before, into another form. It's like a caterpillar to a butterfly. We call that metamorphosis. When a caterpillar becomes a butterfly, it's undergone a change called metamorphosis. So he tells us in this second verse, not to be conformed, but be transformed, watch, by the renewing of your mind. Now that word renew is an important word. That means, it means to restore or regenerate. Restore or regenerate. When you restore something, you put it back into its original condition. When you renew a piece of furniture, usually we call it restoring a, a piece of furniture. We've talked a lot about the restoration of all things, taking all things back to the original design and purpose of the Father uh, before the cross, before Adam and Eve, to the original intent of the Father. So when he's talking about renewing our mind, there must have been a time when our minds were new <laughs> because you can't renew what at one time wasn't new. So he's telling us that we can renew our minds. We can take them back to thinking as they were originally designed to think if we will transform ourselves through the renewing of our mind. We can put that mind back in original condition. I like the way, I like the, way the uh, Passion Translation puts Romans 12 too. Listen to this. Stop imitating the ideas and opinions of the culture around you, but be inwardly transformed by the Holy Spirit through a total reformation of how you think. And man, even though we've been, we've been following Christ a long time, there are still places in our mind that we need a total what the passion says, a total reformation of how we think. This will empower you. This will empower. You wanna be empowered in life? We're looking for that reformation of how we think. This will empower you to discern God's will as you live a beautiful life, satisfying and perfect in his eyes. You wanna learn how to discern God's will? We can't do it with, with, with a bad way of thinking. We can't do it with polluted thinking. We can't do it with the way the culture thinks. So the writer of, of the Passion says, we need a reformation of how we think, and that will empower us to discern God's will. People have problems discerning God's will, and I know the root of it is our thinker, our minds. We're still, we're still messed up. We're still thinking like our culture thinks. All right, there's another verse uh, over in Ephesians chapter four. Ephesians chapter four. In verse 22, I believe it is. Ephesians chapter four and verse, yeah, let me read verse 20 and 21, I believe. We'll stop when I want to stop here. Uh, verse 21 says, if you, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in us, that you put off concerning the former conduct, the old man which is corrupt according to deceitful lust. How do you get rid of this old guy? Is it is it by 
uh, diligent prayer and fasting? Is it by um, keeping church laws, church rules? How, how do we how do we put off this old conduct? This that has been conformed by our culture, has been created by our culture. You've been well groomed in it. He says we do it, verse 23, that we are renewed or restored in the spirit of our minds. I, I want everybody at the Digital Cathedral to really be thinking with a renewed mind. I want us to see through a lens that has a perception of being seated next to Christ in heavenly places. And he says, when you do that, you'll put on the new man, which was created according to God in righteousness and true holiness. So what we're going to do for, this is going to take me two weeks to get through this. I, and, and this is important. This is an important brick in the wall of manifesting as sons and daughters. If you're not thinking right, you can't manifest right. So I want to take two weeks and talk about your mind and my mind. And maybe we can uh, figure out and come through some of these difficulties that seem to plague people through the way that they think. So let's see if we can't iron out some of the stuff, uh, if we can't iron it out, because it's in your mind. All warfare takes place in your mind, right? Guilt takes place in your mind, fear, poor identity. Uh, it, it's all battled and staged in the mind. There's no question about that. The, the fear, uh, the condemnation, it's, it's all a head trip. And, and they really addressed it in these two passages of Scripture. There is a transformation out of conformity that will bring us into a do, new dimension of thinking as we perceive through the lens of seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And he said over in Ephesians 4 that we would actually put on a new man that is created in righteousness and to, in true holiness. In other words, the perception is going to change. You're going to see yourself in, in a way that is improved, that is renewed, that is restored back to the original design. Now, let me say this, and maybe you've never considered this. There's actually only one mind in the universe, and that is the mind of God. That's the only mind that there is. There's one spirit, one life, one power, and one mind. If that's true, <laughs> Don Keithley, if that's true, if there's only one mind, then why do I have all these wrong thoughts? Why do I think negatively? Why, why do I think things that I, I shouldn't be dwelling on? Why do I get hung up on stuff mentally that I have no business thinking? Why, why do I drop that lens of perception of being seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus? Well, we're going we're gonna to talk about that this morning. But I want to just put down, I want to put down a basic truth that there's only one mind. There's only one mind. It may be darkened. It may be blind, it may not be seen correctly, it may not be renewed, restored, transformed, but there's one mind. So let me speak to your spirit. I said that at the beginning. I'm talking to your spirit man this morning. I wanna bypass your intellect. I wanna bypass your brain power. And I wanna, I wanna say some things this morning that I hope will resonate within that will help you to, that will help you in the way that you think. So understanding, the understanding, the one mind so let's understand this morning and let's let's be in agreement that we possess fully the mind of Christ. That is the mind that was endued and granted you. <clears throat> Ephesians 1 chapter 1 verse 4 says when you were placed in Christ Jesus, he placed in Christ before the foundation of the world, part of what was you were placed into was the mind of Christ. Now it's hard it's hard to balance the mind of Christ and a human mind, it's hard to balance those two if you're seeing two minds. And this is where many of us get hung up. We're, we're thinking the mind of Christ in my mind and we're trying to take our mind and make it fit the mind of Christ. Here's where I'm at this morning. Here's where I'm driving at. You have the mind of Christ. It may be covered over. It may be shielded. It, it, may, it may be veiled, but it's in there. That is the mind that you carry. If you're double-minded, if you're seeing two minds, then you know what? If you're thinking mind of Christ and thinking your mind, you'll never hit you'll never hit Romans chapter 12, verse 2, or Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22 and verse 23. You'll never be renewed in the spirit of your mind. You'll never be transformed. You will remain conformed because you'll be battling back and forth between these two minds, your mind, mind of Christ, trying to shed your mind, trying to gain his mind. Let's put that monkey business behind us. Let's just come to a place 
Paul said, you have the mind of Christ. So let's just accept it. Let's say that's true. Let's take that as the baseline this morning. I have the mind of Christ. Now, James addresses this over in James chapter 1. So let, let me just get over to James chapter 1. And let me read verses 5 to 8. James chapter 1, verse 5 in Chapter 1, verse 5 says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, nothing doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. That means it's driven back and forth depending on what circumstances are. It blows this way one day, blows the other way the other day. You're encouraged one day, you're discouraged the next day, you're up, you're down, right? He is a double-minded man, and he is, verse 8 says, he's unstable in all of his ways. If we're going to bring stability into our life, we've got to eliminate double-mindedness. And the double-mindedness occurs when you think you're operating out of two minds. We got, we're, I'll just stay with me this morning. We're going to pull this in. Within that total mind of Christ, listen to me, within that total mind of Christ, the Father gave you the ability to make influenced choices. Sometimes we make good ones, sometimes we make bad ones based on, based on what is the strongest influence in your life at that given time, right? At that given time. In in, let me take you back to Genesis chapter 1. I'm just going to paraphrase this for you. Genesis, I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 3, those, those first six verses where the serpent comes to Eve and presents the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and says, you know what? If you eat this, you'll be like God. That was influencing her. She said, man, we can't eat, every, but we can eat every tree except this one. Because that would ha that's what had influenced her. Stay away from that tree. He says, you can eat this tree. He said, God doesn't want you to eat of it because he's afraid when you do, you're going to become just like him. So Adam's standing with her, and she takes some of whatever you want to think it was she took, and she gave some to Adam who was with her. Now, here's my question. If they had never been influenced by the serpent, would they have made that decision? Would they have made that choice? I doubt it. We don't know how long they lived in the garden before the serpent showed up, whatever you want to think the serpent was. They, made, they did not have a free will. They did not have a free will. They made an influenced choice. And this is, this is so important. I think this is, this is fundamentally important something we have to get a hold of. You don't have two minds. You, you're not working out of a free will out of your mind. What you have is this mind of Christ. You have the ability to make influenced choices. If the Spirit influences you and you make a decision that is influenced by the Spirit, then you're eating from the tree of life. You hear? hear when you hear from the tree of life, it's, it's a very simple procedure. You hear and respond. That's all you do. You follow it. You don't question it. You don't weigh it out. You don't run it through the process. You don't run it through your uh, logistics, right? When you're eating from the tree of life, you hear and you respond. Now, that's one tree that is within you. The other tree that can influence you are choices that you make based on your five physical senses. And that causes you, as it did Adam and Eve, to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And until we learn how to deal with pressures in life, we automatically go to that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and it influences us. Circumstances influence us. Circumstances weigh on us. And so we make something that seems right, that alleviates the pressure. We don't respond. We don't obey. We, we make a decision based on the tree of, of the knowledge of good and evil. Now listen, Adam and Eve were in the garden and they had the option of two trees, but one garden. In the garden, there were both trees. So in our garden, in the kingdom that is within us, we have full provision of everything. But within this garden, there are two trees. The garden to us is the kingdom of God. 
When you seek first the kingdom of God, you're eating at the tree of life. You're making decisions and choices that arise because you are, are making a determination that you want to eat from the tree of life. All right? are, are you with me? So within the one mind, within the mind of God, there's two trees. So what happens if, you, if you've got one mind? What happens if you eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? There are consequences. The, the one mind, the one mind, now listen to me. You're probably going to have to go back and listen to this more than once. The one mind, like a GPS, will use the wrong turn, will use the wrong decision, and it will take and guide you right back on track and influence you to come to the tree of life. It's all by influence. The father works by influence. He's an influencer. He doesn't twist your arm. He doesn't threaten you. Uh, he, 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 uses, he uses influence. He influences us in two ways. Listen, the father influences us in two ways, by revelation and by love. And those two ways, when, when we begin to eat from the tree of life, we begin to operate out of the mind of Christ, we begin to, to unveil the mind of Christ. We begin to move away from that tree, that option that we have that has been given to us. We begin to make the right decisions, the right choices. All of a sudden, this abundant life begins to spring up within us. Now, perhaps you understand what Paul meant in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, when he said, all things work together for good to those that love God and are called according to his purpose. That means even bad choices. How can bad choices, how can bad decisions that I make from eating at the wrong tree, how can that work to my advantage? How can that still get me where I need to go? The one mind that you have, the mind of the Father, we call it the mind of Christ, which is within you, the one mind will guide you in such a way that you'll still end up at the right destination. The Father will work through love and revelation. He will continue to turn that dial up, that revelation dial, that love dial, until you begin to be influenced and drawn to the tree of life that is within you, that is within the one mind that you have. And you begin to eat from that tree, you begin to recognize the influence of the Father. And Paul said in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, that when you do that, you're conforming out of this society, out of this dimension, and you're being transformed as your mind is renewed. The mind, the mind begins to pick up on, this, this is the tree that I want to eat from. This is the direction I want to go. Now, there are times, circumstances, and pressures push on us. We're going to make some bad choices. No question about it. But the GPS will put you right back on course. Adam and Eve were gps to the last Adam. So the last Adam came and fulfilled what the first Adam failed to do, and the last Adam reconciled the entire cosmos back to the Father. I think about Joseph. I love Joseph in the Old Testament. Joseph suffered because of others' choices and decisions. And this is one thing you, you can't control. You can't there's nothing you can do about when other people make bad choices and decisions. Sometimes we do suffer the consequences of it. But listen, if you'll continue to make right choices, even when you find yourself in a situation being the victim of other people's bad choices and decisions, it will still ultimately work to your benefit and good. In fact, it worked in Joseph's life. He came not only through bad choices of his brothers, but through Potiphar's wife, through the jailer. I mean, this poor guy went from about age 17 to about age 31, subject to all kind of bad choices from other people, yet the choices and decisions he made obviously were not based upon circumstances. He was, he was coming from a different perspective. He's coming from a different place. And ultimately, ultimately, he became prime minister of the land and his brothers come to him for food. Now watch what he says. He says, the things, guys, that you meant for evil, selling me into slavery, trying to extinguish my life, things that you meant for evil, God has taken those and worked those and worked those out for the perfect good in my life to bring me to this point when I can save the nation. See, all the bad choices, all the bad decisions we make will be influenced and guided back through love and revelation to Philippians chapter 2, verse 10 and 11, which says that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess 
that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I said he doesn't twist your arm, he doesn't force you. That is not, that is not a forced confession. That's bringing all of us to a place where we recognize the good news, where we recognize what Jesus has fully accomplished for all of mankind and everybody that has made bad choices, bad decisions. They, they, they are GPSed and influenced back back to the tree of life that functions within them. They may have made bad choices out of, out of the, the, uh, the conformed mind, but he will transform it and he will bring it out to where it ultimately works for our benefit. Now, follow me, I'm, I'm gonna make another point here. All right, so are you with me? Can you see how we have one mind that's being clouded over? When you begin to see light, man, light floods in, why? Because all of a sudden now, you're recognizing the mind of Christ that is functioning within you. Now, in the kingdom, there's a couple of groups of people, uh, so far as minds are concerned, mentality is concerned, that want to eat from the tree of life and learn to live out of kingdom resources. All of us at the digital cathedral this morning can fit one of these two groups, all right? Now, let's just, let's just assume you're buying into the fact that you do have the mind of Christ. If, don't take my word for it. Study it out for yourself. Let's, let's just assume the fact that we have the mind of Christ. Let's assume that we want to be not conformed to this world. We're looking to be transformed. We're looking to renew our minds even to a greater level and a degree than they are right now. So there's going to be two groups of people that assemble at the Digital Cathedral and over at the Secret Place on, on Wednesday night that want to eat from the Tree of Life. One group is going to require that every statement be proven with a chapter and verse, right? that it be clear and recorded in at least two places. I mean, come on now, let them let everything be established in the mouth of two or three witnesses. So it's not received until it's fully grasped and every mental construct is fully satisfied. Now, that's mind of Christ. That's just a different way that the mind of Christ functions from within some of us. That's not a negative thing. That's not, you, you, want, you want to be shown. You want, you want it to, to, to be laid out for you. Listen, I can relate to that. I lived most of my adult life in the ministry. If you don't have a chapter, don't have a verse, and I still travel in the yeah, but, and what if. <laughs> Even though you could show me, say, well, yeah, but, what if, because I already had my perception built. Now, here's what God's going to do with that group of people. He's going to change the lens through which you see Scripture. I've been through that. It's part of the, the, tr the transforming of the mind. You, you see something in scripture that catches you that you go, wow, I never saw that before. Why, did, why didn't I see that? There's something there that I need to uncover. So he's starting that process with those of you that got to have the chapter, got to have the verse, your word people, bless God, your word people. And I'm not making light of that because I was there. I understand fully where you're coming from. What he does, he flips the script. He flips the script on you, and you start to see things you never saw before. In fact, you think you're reading a brand new Bible. You begin to see in Scripture the unconditional love of God, the inclusion of humanity in, in the, the finished work of the cross. You begin to see God's mercy that endures forever. You begin to see all this stuff, and, and now your mind is beginning to change. It's come through scripture. It's come through scripture. And, and, and I was there, man. I, there'd be times I'd have to pick up my Bible, look at the binding, make sure I was still reading the New King James Version of the Bible because I go, how could I have been in ministry so long? How could I have gone through so many years of education and never saw any of this stuff before? Why didn't some white-haired PhD back when I was a 20, 21-year-old kid getting started, why didn't they know this? Why didn't they teach it? It was veiled. It was veiled. So the, the mind that we have, the mind of Christ, now begins to function. All right now, there's a second group, much simpler, much simpler. It's a group that want to become as little children. And, and Jesus said in, in Matthew 18, verse 3, now he's going to bring all of us to this point. Some just come an easy way, some come a little bit harder. Us, us that were scripture guys, you know, we came a little bit harder because we had to come through this obstacle of chapter and verse. But God totally eliminated that when he began to show us in Scripture what we had never seen before. 
Now, other people come and are willing to hear what the Spirit of God is saying to them, and they will grab it like that. They will believe it and take it just like a small child. So Jesus said in Matthew 18 and verse 3, and, and I, I, I want to read this because it's very simple, not many words to it, but this is where we all come in. Jesus said, assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted, the word strafo, it means dramatic change, uh, following an opposite course. Unless you are dramatically changed and become as little children, words pation means toddler, small child, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. This is the process. The mind of Christ begins to emerge, right? And we, we make this this, this drastic change. And now, either through seeing scripture through an entirely different lens, we become like little children. We want to, we just want to gobble up. We want to learn, 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 learn. And we, we want to take the Bible and get all we can out of it. Or the other group is, man, we just hear it and we become like little children and we believe what the Spirit is telling us, even though we might not know the chapter and the verse. That's, that's just an amazing happening right there. All right, so children are just taught the first step. And when they see that first step, the light comes on and they're off to the races. They receive light and revelation directly from the spirit of truth. And it's very simple for them. They read or hear or get a thought. It opens the door. They're contemplating, they're meditating. They're like children. Whatever they think now out of this mind of Christ that has been renewed, they're able to grab onto it. Now, both group one and birth, birth Group two, both of the groups will reach the same goal. It's going to take group one a little bit longer because they're scripture mechanics, right? They're scripture me mechanics. But the same goal is within the mind of Christ to unveil and to reveal. And I don't condemn either group. I don't condemn either group. Because even though I needed the chapter and the verse, there was a point that I became like a little child, right? But there, there is a group that'll take a lot longer than group one and group two. And this is some here old church friends. They're the arguers. They're the debaters. Those that, those that only want to use the construct, the box that they're fit in right now because they're real comfortable. They're secure in that. So that's, that's where they want to, to stay. And what doesn't fit that box, they're going to argue about. They, their word mechanics, extraordinaire, right? They, they take it all apart. They examine it. And they use the tree of the knowledge of good and evil of what they already perceive to be truth to either embrace it or reject it. The problem is this always leads to a spiritual dead end. Those people are always coming to a spiritual dead end. They're attempting to take the infinite and squeeze it into this quart-sized, finite brain capacity, right? Now, look, look what Paul said. Paul, Paul ran into these guys all the time. First Corinthians chapter two, first Corinthians chapter two and, and verse 14. First Corinthians chapter two and verse 14. I'm in second Corinthians. Let me just back up here. First Corinthians, chapter 2 and verse 14. This, this nails it for some, some folks. The natural man does not receive. He doesn't see, receive. He, he doesn't, uh, I think the word's lambano. He doesn't grab hold of. He doesn't welcome it, right? The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. Their foolishness to him, neither can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. So as long as this man is operating as a natural man, doesn't mean he doesn't love Jesus. I'm talking about a third group that want to argue, want to debate. Uh, even though you should, even though they have been shown from Scripture, see, they're still seeing through that evangelical lens. So their 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 Christ's mind is veiled. It's veiled. They can't see, and as a result, they're they're in their mind. They're eating over here from the wrong tree. They get very close to seeking first the kingdom of God. Their heart is toward God, and they have. There's so many good people that are trapped in that quart-sized box trying to fit God in it. And they're not going to believe nothing except what they've already been taught. But there will always be a shadow of doubt. There will always be a, a hesitancy to fully let go of what their mind grasps 
for what they can't fully see. And until they can fully see it, and it's an act of the spirit, they're not gonna change. You can argue with your friends that are still in the church. You can debate with them. You can show them scripture. They're not gonna get it. It's an act of the spirit. The spirit at one point will trigger a scripture and they will start to see with different lens. Or somebody will say something. All of a sudden, they will hear with different ears. The, the one-minded GPS will eventually bring them to that Matthew 18, three, where they become as a little child, right? It, it'll, it'll come to light like this. Let, let's read, let's read on just a little bit in 1 Corinthians chapter two. Let's go verse nine. As it is written, eye is not seen or is ear heard, neither is it entered into the heart of man, the things which God has prepared for those that love him. And there are people in the evangelical church today that really love God. I, I don't doubt that. They're trapped in a system. I never come against the people. I come against a system. I come against, I come against this, this monster that has deluded people for generations. I has I doesn't see, hasn't entered the heart of man. Think of what God has prepared. But watch, God has revealed them to us by his spirit, for the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. So as they begin to search, if they're really sincere in their search, every natural thing that they counted on, all of a sudden one day doesn't cut it anymore, doesn't satisfy them. They go, you know, there's gotta be more. I, they, they get a spiritual itch that the natural mind that has been programmed by religious thinking, it just doesn't itch the scratch that they have. And in, and in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, now what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God, except by the spirit of God. So light begins to shine from the center of their being because they're in pursuit. And so they, they begin this shift. And I'm trying to encourage you today with some of your friends that are still stu stuck in religion, still st stuck in evangelical churches. They, they begin to see some light. Something filters in. It's an act of the spirit. You can't argue them out of it. You can't, you can't out-Bible them. You can play scriptural ping pong with them day after day. They ain't gonna work. All of a sudden, the spirit begins to show some light and they start shifting to the tree of life. Their mind begins to renew. All of a sudden, the, the mind of Christ that has always been within them because Christ has been within them. Remember what Paul said in Galatians 1, 15, 16? When it pleased the Father who separated me from my mother's room to reveal the Christ that was in me. He was always in there. The Christ can't be in you unless the mind of Christ is in you. He's not mindless when he's in you. So there's been this one mind, but we haven't been thinking from the mind of Christ. We've been thinking from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Been thinking from the wrong part of the mind of Christ. There, there's, there's, so for those that are, are under that group one or the, the arguers. See, they got they have to wait through years and years sometimes of proof. There's, there's a, and thank God there's a lot of good books. There's a lot of good teaching today. There's a lot of good resources that were, that has not been available, but it's part of this reformation that's going on. Think, information, resources are out there. But, con, but consider this. If we would just open, consider this. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 25. The foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than man. What he's saying there is just be open. Some of you here at the Digital Cathedral, you might be in that group one. Man, you've got to be shown the verse, the chapter, and even when you're shown, you're, you're, you're in this box, you've got God in the box, and you're saying, yeah, but what if? What, it, what about this verse over here? And I can always tell when people are not totally renewed in the mind of Christ because they run into a verse that would seem to contradict what the spirit of truth has revealed. And they immediately panic. They get on, they get on uh, Facebook or on social media somewhere and they say, what about this verse? How do you all see this verse? How does grace fit into this verse? Listen, you need to slow it down. You need to slow it down. 
you have direct access to all that there is within the Father. You are functioning out of the mind of Christ. Now, I, I will grant you that it's a process and it can be a slow process, but that's fine. You, you learn to take the journey at your own pace. I travel at one pace, you travel at another pace. It's all good. We're all gonna end up at the same de definition, right? In, in, in Mark chapter 12, Mark chapter 12, I, I hope you're catching this today because I'm trying to encourage you about your mind. I'm trying to let you see that your mind is undergoing a change. It's undergoing a severe process that, you know, there was, there was a time you would have totally rejected it, but now you're beginning to submit to it. And it's kind of like this here in Mark chapter 12, uh, verse 35, Jesus answered and said, well, I taught in the temple. How is it that the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? For David himself said by the Holy Spirit, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, David himself calls him Lord. How is he then his son? And the common people heard him gladly. We need to become as children. See, the common people didn't have all this intellectual built up. They didn't. The seminary trained Pharisees, the seminary trained scribes had a problem. But what Jesus said, this is so strong, what Jesus said resonated with the ordinary people. So unless you become like a child, it could be illustrated with ordinary people. My seminary degree, my, my years as a, hadn't helped a bit. But when I began to come as a child, all of a sudden the lens changed, the perspective changed, you see things differently. When it resonates within, when it resonates within, it starts making your mind bow its knee. And there will come a time that what you're, 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 you're perceiving within, what's going on inside of you, your mind will catch up with it. See, there was a day I had to, to figure it out. I had to figure it all out. I had to intellectually come to a conclusion before I could believe it. If, 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 if your mind has been renewed to respond or debate, that's, that's the issue. Is your mind renewed to respond to what the Spirit of God shows or is your mind renewed to debate? That, that's an intellectual understanding. And when you're, when you're living by intellectual understanding, you vacillate back and forth. We read it from James. You're not stable. You're not convinced. You're always searching for the yeah, but scripture. And you'll notice on Don Keithley ministry page, there'll be people come and say, what about this verse in Thessalonians? What about this verse in Romans 1? What about this? What about that? They're always, until you become as a child, you're always learning, but you're never coming to the knowledge of the truth. The knowledge of the truth comes through the mind as it's renewed. So when I entered into what I was seeing within, my spirit got it, but my, I tell you what, my head gave me a lot of trouble for, for quite some time. My spirit understood it. So how, what happened? I had to become like a child. I had to become like a child. And I still searched my Bible. I still was trying to prove it out of the Bible. I, I, there came a point that I went, I went to, to where all my bookshelves were over my study at the church, and I got rid of 600 books, 600 books. I got rid of every CD. I, we were past the old cassette tape. Remember cassette tapes? I had, we had already moved past that, but they still had some cassette tapes back in the sound booth. I got rid of those. I walked out hundreds, literally hundreds of CDs. I, I had to get rid because I was now, I was learning from my spirit. It was a new day. It was a new time. It was a new opportunity. See, the mind will catch up. There's no question about it. Your mind will catch up to your spirit, but it takes some time. What will renew your mind and begin to make the, the, the mind of Christ manifest is what the spirit teaches it. The spirit teaches it. And the mind will resist. The mind will tell you, are you sure about that? I, maybe that's wrong. Maybe that's heresy. Maybe that's error. Maybe that's wrong. 
Let me tell you, if you make a wrong choice, a wrong decision, the Holy Spirit GPS will take you down and turn you around, bring you back and put you on the right course. Stop being afraid of error. Stop being afraid of being deceived. When you're going to know that you know that you know at some point, that's not, I don't, I think I'm moving off of that. He may take you into something just to educate you because you're going to, you're going to deal with somebody that is in that thing, right? Stop being afraid of stuff. Lean back and trust. Let go of stuff. Let, let go. Let go intellectually of trying to figure, figure this whole thing out. Begin to listen to the tree of life that is within you. Two trees. Two trees. Your mind's going to operate out of one of those two trees. And when your mind operates out of it, your flesh obeys. Your flesh reacts to that. The mind will catch up. But the shortcut up the hill of truth is to learn from within. It is to learn from the spirit that is within you. Ultimately, you will anyway. I'm trying to get you to lay your intellect down to renew your mind. <laughs> your mind is renewed through spirit. I woke up in the middle of the night last night. Usually before I go to bed, before I go to sleep, I say, Father, look, my spirit never sleeps. Teach me while I sleep. I don't, I don't need downtime. I don't, I don't want downtime. Teach me while I sleep. I woke up with this thought. It was about two o'clock in the morning. I woke up and, and here's the thought. The mind does not receive revelation. The mind grasps perceptions and knowledge and um, uh, education. The spirit is what receives revelation. So what's going to renew your mind? This is two o'clock in the morning. What's going to renew your mind? I knew I was teaching that this morning. What's going to renew your mind is the revelation your spirit gets. Your mind does not get revelation. Your mind needs to be renewed. And when it's renewed, it's taken back to the way that God intended it from the beginning, which is to operate out of this mind of Christ. He placed you in Christ before time began. And when he placed you in Christ, he placed within you the mind of Christ that you can learn to function with. We call it the tree of life, right? We call it the tree of life. Call it seeking first the kingdom of God. All those all those phrases hit people differently, but it is to bring you into the same place to where what the Spirit of God says to you, you respond to it. You don't argue, you don't debate, you respond. Jesus said, I only do what I see the Father do. I only say what I hear the Father say. That's responding. That's responding. Jesus didn't get a piece of paper out, draw a line down, put, I should on this side, I shouldn't on this side. And whichever side had more points, that was a logical choice. That's what he did. He responded to the Father. We're learning to respond. The spirit of truth from the mind of the spirit always trumps intellectual understanding on spiritual matters. Let me say that again. Spiritual truth from the mind of the spirit, the mind of Christ, always trumps intellectual understanding that comes from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. All right, let me, let me just wrap this up. We'll carry it on further next week. Seek light from the spirit of truth within you, right? That's the, be the best thing I can tell you. The best thing I can tell you is that this is something you're probably going to have to go alone. You're going to have to, you're going to have to, Weigh it out. Think it alone. Think by spirit alone. Seek it alone. And you will renew your mind at your pace. I wanted to really drive at your pace home this morning. See, if it doesn't come immediately, if you're still wrestling with some stuff, crockpot it. Slow cook it. You, one of the worst things you can do is when you run up, to a verse or there's something that you're not catching spiritually, one of the worst things you can do is to run out and ask 10 people. You will get 10 opinions. Based on where they're at in the journey, they will tell you their their opinion. And that's exactly what it will be. It will be their opinion. And that, that creates the double-mindedness. Learn, learn, listen, learn to go it alone. Learn to think alone. Learn to meditate alone. Learn to ponder by yourself. And, and, and let stuff work its way through your life. That's how your mind is renewed. When the, when the spirit is able to break through to your mind, you're going to be transformed out of the pattern of this world. 
and your mind will come back. It'll begin to spring back to the place that it was that the Father intended it from the beginning. You don't need to ask 10 people. You don't need to run out to a prophetic meeting and, and, and try to look at the prophet so that he'll call on you and give you a word of the Lord. You need to get grounded in yourself. This is, this is a day when the father is dealing with the sons and the daughters directly. Do, do you hear me loud and strong? He's dealing with us directly. Now, I have people I talk to. I have people I, I bounce things off of. But you know what? There is a line of demarcation that I know I have got to get it for me. And once I get it for me, I got it. My mind is renewed. I'm transformed. I'm not thinking the same. I'm not responding the same. I'm not acting the same because there's been a change. That's what happens with grace. Grace is a divine influence that produces effortless change as you rest in him. That's another way of saying that grace will renew your mind. The Father will influence you. This is a journey. This is a journey. You don't need other people's opinions all the time. When I teach at the Digital Cathedral, you, you don't just take it and run with it. I don't mind. I don't mind you questioning. I don't mind you challenging. You know, if, if you're doing it to, because you want to come to a good ploy, place, you need revelation for yourself from the spirit of truth from which when you, when you have it, no man can steal it from you. And you know what will happen? Your mind will submit to it. Your mind will submit to it and it'll be transformed. Amen? All right, I think we've gone far enough this morning. That's part one uh, of two parts of you ain't double-minded and stop thinking two minds. I want you to grab the one mind that you have right? and start thinking tree of life in your mind. Start thinking what he says I respond to. And as you do that, as you, as you adhere to that, you're going to find change begins to take place. You're going to, you're going to think entirely different. Amen. All right. Make sure you hit the subscribe and the like. It's very important that you subscribe. You're notified when we come on, hit the like. It helps the algorithms to move up when people are looking for a teaching. So I appreciate it. See you Wednesday night at The Secret Place back next Sunday morning. And we will take on part two of You Ain't Double Minded. God bless.